So this morning, I want to talk to you about a word that's a little awkward to try to explain. It's one of those you have to kind of feel to know. It's the word intimacy. It's a challenging topic because it's best understood through experience rather than explanation. I can give you Webster's Dictionary, but that's not the same thing. Um, It makes people uncomfortable, and sometimes they blush when we talk about it in public. I I was in campus ministry and did a lot of premarital counseling because college students are getting married, and they would sit down in my office, and we would get to a subject about intimacy. I would just ask, so how would you define the word intimacy? The the bride-to-be would look at me stone-faced and wouldn't say anything for a bit. I could see her throat and she would take a big gulp. Boom. The groom to be, well, he starts grinning. <laughs> you know, Rob. I'm like, no, I, I want to hear your explanation. Well, it's, you know, it's sex. And say, okay, bride to be, what do you think intimacy is? And one of them said this. She said, intimacy is about being fully known and knowing somebody else. Uh, wow, that was better than my definition, so I wrote it down. Intimacy is about fully knowing. It's about fully knowing and being fully known by another person. We see it in relationships between a mother and a child. I have four kids. My kids love me, and they would respond to me when, I, when they were little babies. But if they were crying and Mary would walk into a room and they heard her voice, they would start looking for her. You've experienced this before? I mean, at that point, I'm just chopped liver. It doesn't matter because mom has a connection with her babies that's different. Uh, It's a beautiful thing we read about in Scripture. Uh, Probably the best definition for intimacy is the word know, K-N-O-W. We see this show up um, first in the context of relationships. Um, Genesis 4.1 says this in some translations, that Adam knew his wife Eve. And she conceived. Now, the Hebrew word for that word no is the word yada. And I'm just going to make it Americanized and say yada. If you pull out that, you would find that that word yada is to know and to be known completely. The NIV translates it a little bit more into the context. So it says that Adam made love to his wife Eve. That's what the NIV translation says. And so it's this intimate connection of sacredness of this intimacy between a husband and man, husband and wife. There are other Hebrew words that they could have used. uh, There's there's the physical act. It's a different Hebrew word. Or for procreation, that's a different word. But here, it is an intimate connection. One Hebrew scholar puts it this way. He says, it's a mingling of the souls that is taking place. So yada is to know and to be known completely. Now, that may seem a little strange for us, for some of you, because we've made it that way. I mean, we've made everything a little awkward. But as you continue reading through scriptures, and particularly in the Old Testament, what you'll find is that that same word, yada, is usually used to, re- to describe God's relationship with us. It shows how God intimately knows us and how he desires to be known by us. And that transforms how we understand our connection with God. It's not superficial or casual, but it's this deep intimacy. So in Psalm 139, David, who's the author, he uses this word yada about six times to describe how God knows us. And it's a very short passage of Psalm 139. David says this. This is verses 1 through 4. O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel, and when I rest at home, you do everything I do. You know what I'm going to say, even before I say it, Lord. He just says, you know, you know, you know. And David is speaking about this intimate way that God knows us. You know how I feel. God, you know how I hurt. You know what I'm thinking. So in this sermon series, we have been looking at the story of Job. And we find that this is something that should 
bring us comfort when we're hurting. But if we look at the story of Job, sometimes we have to wonder, like, why? The God who is a father who knows what we're going through, what we're facing, but he allows these things to happen. And in Job chapter 2, we see this man who has lost everything. He's lost his livelihood. He's lost his kids. His wife says, you know, curse God and die. He talks about his physical condition. He says that his body is falling apart. Here's what the text says, that painful sores were from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. At one point in the story, he's sitting down scraping the boils on his skin with a broken piece of pottery. Covered, literally, in physical suffering. He describes it a little more poetically in chapter 30. In verse 27, he says this, The churning inside me never stops. Days of suffering confront me. Like, there's no end to this. 28, he says, I go about blackened, but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly and I cry for help. He's saying, I'm desperate. I have become a brother of jackals, a companion of owls. I can't even sleep at night. My skin grows black and it peels and my body burns with fever. And then in verse 31, he says, My lyre is tuned to mourning and my pipe to the sound of wailing. God, can you hear the sound of my life? Can you hear the cry? The song that my life is making. It's tuned to mourning. It's tuned to wailing. And Job wants to know, God, do you know? So as I was reading through the book of Job, what stood out to me is that Job's Job's job, Job's main complaint is not about God's control or about God's care necessarily. Job's number one issue is God's awareness. He repeatedly says this desire to, he wants to present his case before God and he's hoping that he can have a hearing where he can explain, here's what I'm going through and here's what I'm facing. And so in Job chapter 38, where we have been spending our last two weeks, God responds to Job's questioning by asserting his control over the universe. We talked about that the first week, over creation around us. But if you read through it, and if you're reading in Hebrew, which... I don't think very few of us would do. That's not me either. Here's what you're going to find over and over again. Almost like a refrain is that same word, yada. In different variations and in, in some places, but every time God talks about a new part of the universe or he talks about a different species of animals, he says this word over and over again. So I just put out a few examples I want to show you. In verse 4, he says, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. That's that word. He goes, Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched the measuring line across us? Verse 18, Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. 33, Do you know the laws of the heavens? Or verse 39 and verse 1, He says, Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? And here's what is happening. I know, you're like, Robin, where are you going with this? As we read through this, Yadana, there's, here's what's happening. God is saying to Job, you don't know. You don't know, Job, but I do. I know all of these things. And Job is experiencing incredible hardship, difficulty, lots of pain and suffering. And God says, I know. It's kind of like when our kids come to us. And they're very upset because you wouldn't let them eat eat ice cream at 10 p.m. so they'll be sugared up. And they're like, but why? It has milk in it. It's healthy. They don't know that they're also not going to be able to sleep, which means you're not going to be able to sleep, which means the next morning, whenever they get up really early and you're still tired, they're going to be bouncing off the walls and their lives are likely going to be at stake. They don't know that. But you do. And God is saying, Job, you don't know all these things, but I do. How can we be sure that God knows us intimately? I think despite, we looked at the first week about the the pale blue dot and how vast our universe is. And David says this in Psalm 39, and he uses the human body as evidence that God knows us. He says this in verse 13. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and you knit me together in my mother's womb. 
Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book, and every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. David says, look at our bodies as evidence. To the fact that God sees us, that God knows. St. Augustine of Hippo said this, Men go abroad to wonder at the heights of mountains, at the huge waves of the sea, at the long courses of the river, at the vast compass of the, compass of the city, of the oceans, and at the circular motion of the stars, and yet they pass themselves by without ever wondering. In other words, within you and within me is so much evidence of our God. We see him when we look in the mirror, the way that our body works. Think about DNA. The human genome holds a vast amount of information. So to try to give you an idea of what that looks like. Back in the day, there was these things called Encyclopedia Britannicas. Before Wikipedia, they were more reliable-ish. Um, and you would buy a volume of those that went on your shelf. That was roughly about 25,000 pages. Metaphorically, one strand of DNA contains enough information to fill about a million page encyclopedia. Just one strand. And what's truly remarkable is the precise and organized content within your DNA. We see how that's being used now. Not only to catch criminals, but also to free innocent people. The human brain is composed of approximately 86 billion neurons. And they form these intricate networks that enable various brain functions. We can't recreate that. The inner ear contains about 15 to 20,000 hair cells that convert sound waves into these nerve impulses that allow us to hear. Husbands, have you ever noticed that your wife um, seems to have a better sense of smell than you? Well, it's very interesting that men and women have a similar number of smell receptors in their noses. But research shows that women often have a better sense of smell because their brains process the smells more actively. This means that even with the same number of receptors, women can detect and distinguish odors better than men. So if she tells you it stinks, just go with it, man. And I'm going to use this as a time to go out the disclaimer and deodorant is your friend. And everybody else's friend, teenagers. <laughs> our lungs. Our lungs resemble these pink sponges with about 300 to 600 million tiny little air sacs that exchange oxygen for carbon dioxide or di carbon dioxide for oxygen. You and I breathe all the time and we don't even think about it. The blood vessels in our lungs stretch about 1,500 miles in total. And when fully expanded, our lungs cover about 70 to 100 square meters. And what this does is it allows us to breathe 17 to 30,000 times daily. The heart beats about 100,000 times a day. It pumps roughly about 2,000 gallons of blood through your body. The blood travels about 60,000 miles of blood vessels. I know this is a lot of information. But it does all of that in less than a minute. The pressure in our large arteries are, is so strong that it exceeds what household steel pipes can handle. Overall, our blood circulates about 2,000 times a day with, through our bodies. With the human nervous system, it is vast and it is intricate. and It is composed of billions of nerve cells and this extensive networks that run through your body. These nerve impulses travel at speeds that range from about 1 to 200 feet per second, depending on the type of nerve and specific conditions. And some of you shorter people, like, it takes no time. I'm looking at you, Sammy. <laughs> In Matthew 10, Jesus mentions that God has this intimate knowledge of us that he has the number of hairs on our head counted. On average, people have about 100,000 hairs on their head. Now, some of you men are bringing that average down. 
But God, Jesus tells us that God knows every one of those hairs that are on your head, how many there are. The Bible says that he knows. He has those hairs counted in our skin. Our skin, we don't, I don't have any pictures of dust, but our skin replaces itself hundreds of times in a lifetime. When you're dusting your house, mostly that's skin. You're welcome. Our, our joints move about 25 million times in our lives, showcasing this design of our bodies. And this does, technology and engineering have not been able to fully replicate what our bodies can do. You're going to love this picture of the human tongue. It's making sure you're awake. The human tongue typically has about 2,000 to 8,000 taste buds. And this allows us to figure out taste and also to know what I like and don't like. Okay, we can go to the next slide. We go through all these facts about the human body. And God says, Yada, I know these things. I know all these things about you. I, I know, I love the way that the message paraphrases this math, this uh, David's words in Psalm 139. It says, you know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. None of that has escaped you, God. Not a bit. And there's just great comfort, I think, in knowing that God knows all of these things. But in the end, Job finds comfort in knowing that none of his suffering has escaped God's attention. He realizes, God, you knew all along and you were never surprised. Back in Job 42, it says, you asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I, Job says, and I was talking about things that I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me to know. God, you know what I don't know. Things that are so big and wonderful. And it's a word that you don't expect to be used in the middle of such pain and suffering is wonderful. But when he realizes what God knows, he goes, okay. David also says this in Psalm 56. You have, count, you have kept count of my tossings. You have put my tears in a bottle. Are they not in your book? Every tear that falls. God, do you know the story behind it? And there's something comforting to me about that. It doesn't make sense on one hand because it's not like something changes, but just knowing that God knows makes a big difference. I feel like I have an audience. I mean, isn't that why support groups are so effective? People will go to um, a support group and some people go, oh, what good is that going to do? We're all going to sit around and just talk about our problems. But there is something really special in that. Having been around parents who have lost their children, no, nothing can replace that lost child, but they can have a conversation with someone else who has gone through that and it makes a world of difference. It doesn't remove their hurt, but it's helpful to know you know what it's like to go through this. People who come and be a part of Celebrate Recovery. It's not just people who are addicted to drugs or alcohol. It's people who are dealing with all of life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And I don't know about you, but I got plenty of those on all three levels. And they come in there and they say, here is what I am dealing with. And they talk about how they can support each other. If you experience this, you know that it's something that you know that other people know helps. That's why Hebrews tells us this about Jesus. The Son of God, it says this in chapter 2, for this reason, Jesus had to be made like them, fully human, in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. A high priest who can intercede on our behalf because he goes, God, I understand. I have been human. I have put on flesh. I know what it's like. And that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. And this next verse says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus knows this. Maybe you have family that doesn't understand you and they're disappointed in you. And Jesus says, look, I know what that's like. My own family thought I was crazy. They didn't understand me. Maybe there's somebody that you love that has betrayed you. Jesus understands that. One of his faithful followers betrayed him with a kiss. For money. Maybe it's been friends that have let you down. Friends that you thought were going to be there and then they disappeared. And Jesus says, I know what that's like too. See, hung on a cross, where were they? Maybe it's physical suffering that you're experiencing and maybe it feels overwhelming. And it's just, I think there's some beauty in that. 
that when Jesus is risen from the dead, he still has his scars in his hand. And he tells Thomas, put your hand, put your finger in the holes in my hand. Put your hand in my side. Stop doubting. Because he knows what it's like to suffer. I've heard it said that in heaven there will only be one person who still has scars, and that is Jesus. And I don't know if that's true or not. But for me, it's comforting to know that I have a Savior who understands what it's like. Because within our molecular structure, there is a protein molecule that, um, called laminin. Now, I've watched the Louis Giglio video. Maybe you have too. And there's some, some interesting things about that. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, so let me explain. Laminin molecules, uh, along with other molecules, they don't do this on their own, but they form these networks that help hold our cells together, and they, sup- they provide a structural support for tissues like your skin and your muscles and your organs. And its primary function, this protein called laminin, is cell adhesion. It holds us together, not by itself, but it That's what its function is. This is what it looks like under uh, extremely close look. And the way that they have drawn out the diagram to help teach this is always in a cross. Now, I don't want to make a big deal about the fact that, oh, it's cross-shaped. People have done that. I think that's pushing it. But what it is, it functions in its role for binding and stabilizing cells and tissues. What I do think this does, though, is it points to a creator who knew what he was doing. It points to a God who designed our bodies in such a complex way. Paul tells us who that God was. He says in in Colossians 1, For in him, for in Christ Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Things He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It's saying that Jesus isn't just the source, but he's also the glue. He is the principle of cohesion. He is the one that holds all the things together. And we can look at it as we've talked about the universe and the earth. He is the central force of gravity that keeps our cosmos together. Paul says Jesus made all these things. He controls all these things, and he holds all these things together. And that flies in the face of us who think, well, uh, my world is all about making sure that It revolves around me. We have such control issues. But God has chosen a cross as a symbol of his commitment. And it shows how far he is willing to go to know us intimately, that he became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus came to serve and to be king for us through the washing away of our sins. Our sin separates us from God, and he desires intimacy with us because he created us for that purpose. And we forget it. I know. We're just distracted by other things. I understand pressures of life, but these things rob our attention. And they take us away from why we were made to know God intimately, not just casually, not just a weekend show up to church fling, but it's this intimate relationship with our creator. Every star that shines, every bird that flies through the sky, and every time your heart beats is an invitation for you to know God. David says these words, God, as the deer pants for the water, as the deer thirsts for water, so my soul thirsts for you. And you don't say that to somebody that you have a casual relationship with. You say that to a close friend. You say that to someone that you love deeply and dearly. And David is saying, God, I want to be, I want you desperately because God, I know you are after me always. And I'm convinced that we're going to see as much God as we look for. We're going to be filled with as much God as we hunger for. Paul, God says to his people in Jeremiah, he says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. In other words, when you want me more than anything else. So think about your life. What are your top pursuits? What are the things that you are most ambitious about? Your jobs? The attention of a person or groups? Popularity? Just want to fit in? How 
How desperate are you to achieve those things? How much do you align and change the correct, the, your course correct so that you can fulfill those goals? David says, God, that's what I want for you. I want you to be the direction I am going. I want you to be the thing that I want more than anything. And God says, I want to yada. I want to know you deeply. I know you deeply. I want you to know me. And that happens by coming to know God, Son, who put on flesh and made his dwelling among us, who lived a perfect and holy life, but took on the sins of creation, the sins that the debt that we owed, so that he could pay that debt because we couldn't do it. We couldn't keep the perfect law. So Jesus said, I've got it. My father in law, who I love dearly, he just says constantly, I just hope I've done enough to make it to heaven. And I, without reservation, will tell him, You haven't. And none of you have. But Jesus did. And he sits at the Father's throne and he intercedes for us. Come to Jesus. Know Jesus. That's where real life happens. Let me pray over us. God, I... um, We get distracted. And Father, we get so caught up in our own messes and our own world that we forget that our number one goal is to seek after you. We have things that we desperately seek for, but I I wonder if sometimes those are on the throne of our hearts more than you are. I know I wrestle with that. God, I'm so thankful for Jesus who paid a debt that he didn't owe. I'm so thankful that he opened a door so that we have a king who intercedes for us. God, I pray that you will help us to see you, encounter you in our bodies, encounter you in creation and in our our universe, but to look no further, to be reminded that you know and you care. Thank you for being present with us even when we don't see you or look for you. Draw us deeper, Lord, to the cross, to Jesus, because he cares for us. So that we can truly say, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Help us to press on. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.